um, and, and there we go. Recording is in progress. Uh, welcome everyone to Chicago Water Week with the Alliance for the Great Lakes, Elevate Energy, Illinois Environmental Council, and Little Village Environmental Justice Organization. Uh, my name is Donna Lisa Castle. Um, I'm with the Alliance for the Great Lakes, and I'm just going to go ahead and open up um, our panel on achieving lead-free affordable drinking water in Chicago um, with a land acknowledgement. Uh, we are all coming, uh, we're all calling in um, from the city of Chicago, which is the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi, Adawa, Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk Nations. Um, and it is uh, one of the largest urban American Indian communities in the U.S. today. Um, and we're here today to talk about, you know, one of our most precious resources, which is which is water, um, here on the shores of Lake Michigan. Um, but you know, thinking about how our Lake Michigan water meets us in our homes, um, whether that's through drinking water, I'm going to be sipping on my water bottle um, throughout this conversation, or how we um, bathe our children, how we cook our food, how we wash. Um, Water service is critical to daily life, um, but we know that um, it's not something that we can take for granted. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about water affordability and uh, lead-free safe water service um, for all Chicagoans. So before we get started, I'm, I, I am gonna ask the, the speakers to introduce themselves here, um, but I just wanna level set a little bit um, by acknowledging that in the city of Chicago, we've seen over a 10 year period water, the cost of water service for the average family of four, um, more than triple. We've seen this trend of, of water rates and water costs rising across the US. Um, at the same time, water infrastructure is very expensive. And one of the um, critical investment needs is, is removing lead service lines um, from our water systems uh, and, and getting toxic infrastructure out of our homes. Um, today, we're going to be hearing from some of the leading advocates here in Chicago who are working on achieving um, affordable, lead-free water. Um, and I'm going to kind of go in order here. I'm going to ask, by, alphabet by alphabetical order, I'm going to ask um, Ann Evans from Elevate Energy to please, um, first of all, welcome and please introduce yourself. Um, tell us a little bit about, about you and your org and what you're, what you're working on. Hi, Ann Evans with Elevate. So happy to be with you all today. And so happy to be on this panel with Annalisa, Iana, and Brenda, um, a great group of um, strong women advocates. So really proud to be with you all. Um, Elevate has a vision where everyone has healthy, safe, affordable ways to have heat power when water in their homes, no matter who they are and where they live. And we sadly know that that is not the case. Um, and so we uh, um, design and deliver programs that provide direct benefits to people, inclu including energy efficiency, solar, uh, more efficient water use, um, and lead service line replacement so that we can get to that place where we have healthy, safe, affordable water in our in your homes. We believe this is to be a human right, um, and we advocate for policies that help us correct the inequities um, and look look forward to that. Um, Annalisa, do you want me to talk more in depth about what we're doing now? or? I think we're going to get into it, um, uh, and and please uh, find opportunities to jump in as we as we kind of get going. But if I can um, ask Brenda Santoyo from Little Village Environmental Justice Organization Alvejo to give us just a quick introduction and like same with Aunt, with answer to Anne's question, we're going to go ahead and jump into some of the deeper work that all of our organizations are doing together and and independently. Um, but Brenda, please introduce yourself. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Brenda Santoyo and I'm a policy analyst uh, at the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization, El Vejo for short. Um, if you, if hopefully you all know who we are, if not, um, El Vejo focuses on addressing the needs of the community, communities who are at the front line of environmental injustices. Um, some, of the, some of the things that we focus on are air pollution, uh, the lack of green space, water access, um, food insecurity, to name a few of the programs that we are working on. 
Um, I personally do work around advocacy, outreach, and research pertaining to water justice uh, throughout the city of Chicago and at a state level. Uh, more specifically, I do work around uh, water affordability, investments in water infrastructure, and addressing like urban flooding in the city. Um, some of the work that we do, most of the work that we do as an organization, we do jointly with a number of water advocates throughout the city. Some of, um, like Anne said, um, working with Ayana, Annalisa, among, among other experts in the field of, of water and environmental, um, environmental research. Um, we, El Bejo is also a part of the Chicago Environmental Justice Network uh, that addresses um, a number of environmental justice issues throughout the city of Chicago. Um, and then also as a side note, El Bejo also represents the community um, where the city of Chicago is conducting their lead service line replacement pilot program on the South Ridgeway block. Um, but yeah, just happy to be here and I'm excited to have these conversations with you all. Wonderful, we're excited to have you and we're gonna definitely get into that in a little bit. Um, Ayana, please introduce yourself and then, uh, and then we'll jump into it. Cool, hi everyone, Ayana Simba. I'm the city programs director for the Illinois Environmental Council. Um, for folks who are not familiar with us, we have been around since 1975 and really what we do is we represent over 100 different environmental organizations and individuals throughout the state, um, really around conservation, energy and climate and water. Um, and my, my, myself personally, um, prior to the, my position as the city programs director, I was the clean water policy director and prior to that, I was a clean water advocate for IEC. So I have quite a bit of knowledge in uh, water and I'm happy to share it, but also learn from some of my fellow colleagues here today. Um, I guess the most noticeable, th notable thing that IEC has done related to water is we recently passed our lead bill, uh, House Bill 3739. Yes, 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 class, this is after three years of hard work that we were able to pass this and this will um, make sure that, you know, Illinois is moving towards replacing all of its lead service lines. Um, so that's IEC, that's myself, and I'm just really happy to be here on this panel and again, share what I know, but also learning from uh, my colleagues. Wonderful, we're so grateful to all of you for being with us and to folks who um, we can't see, but who we can see in the chat um, who are participating here today. If, um, if y'all have questions that come up, please go ahead and use the chat. And um, I think everybody is muted, but just out of respect for the conversation, um, please note to mute yourself if that becomes an issue. Um, and with that, I would like to just start off on the question of, of access um, to, to safe, clean water. Um, I want to acknowledge that we're, we continue to be in sort of an exceptional moment. Um, and we're working under the circumstances connected right to the pandemic. And actually one of the things that brought, I think all four of us and several more of our colleagues together was this question around water access during the early days of the, the coronavirus pandemic. Um, we, are, we celebrate the water shutoff moratorium that was in place prior to the pandemic here in Chicago. Um, that was an early step that, um, that Mayor Lightfoot's administration took. And so while we weren't, you know, we didn't have an, the immediate, um, you know, fear of folks having their water disconnected, um, what we recognize, right, is that some folks were, were living without water since before um, the moratorium went into place. Um, recognize that even folks who have water service can't always trust the water coming from their taps for various reasons including fear around lead contamination, and spe especially in homes with small children. Um, and so I wanna start there um, with this question of access. And I wanna ask Brenda um, to, to kind of open up this piece of the conversation. I, I know that Alvejo has been a, a leader, right, in water access and distribution programs during the pandemic and, and, and prior to, um, to the pandemic including calling for the, the shutoff moratorium in the first place. Um, but El has been doing that work while also juggling a number of environmental justice priorities that intersect, right? And I, I think of the Hillco explosion that happened um, during the pandemic last year. And I'm just, I'm, I wonder if you can kind of start us off by sharing a little bit about the connection that you see between water access and other environmental justice priorities and how your work and your team's work has adapted during the pandemic. 
Yeah, so um, like you said, I feel like last year we were in a really interesting place. You know, the pandemic really amplified like the urgency of addressing some of these issues, not just water issues, but environmental justice issues as well. Uh, you know, many of these households were already faced with barriers to accessing water and just trusting the quality of the water in their homes. Um, but we really saw that it was like a very dire time to, um, you know, do something about it and actually like do work around making sure that these households had access to the most basic necessities. Um, you know, the Hillco implosion, um, if you all are not familiar with it, um, it was a demolition of a former decommissioned coal plant in the neighborhood. Um, it occurred in March 2020 towards what was the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and the botched implosion left a visible cloud of dust and debris over the neighborhood. Um, this was something that was like really concerning to us. Uh, you know, several studies showed that there was a relationship between air pollution and the severity of COVID. Um, and in a neighborhood that was already dealing with some of the highest numbers of COVID rates at the time, it was something that was super concerning. Um, we were also concerned about addressing, um, we were also concerned about the impact that like the implosion had on the water infrastructure of like the nearby homes. So we felt that we had to do some type of response uh, to make sure that households had the adequate like materials to like, you know, get through this. So we did door to door knocking within the vicinity of the implosion. Uh, we distributed water to households. And as we were speaking to residents like during the door knocking, uh, we found out that like some residents, um, their water pressure had changed and, so, and some residents um, even expressed that the appearance and the smell of their water had also changed. Um, so we were able to like reach out to the city. Um, the city was able to like, you know, check the water mains and inspect like um, the water. They were able to test the water in individual homes um, and they were able to address the issue. I believe it was stagnant water that was causing that, that changed like the water flow. Um, but I think that it, that event really like showed us that um, these residents are like dealing with like multiple issues at once, right? It was like the air pollution problem. They were dealing with COVID-19. And then on top of that, they were dealing with the water issues. So it's something that like they are just like dealing with accumulating crises, like, like, you know, over and over again. Um, I think another thing is that like, we don't often talk, well, you don't immediately think about how um, a lot of these times these homes are like predisposed to like other, um, other forms of lead that aren't just like in their water. Um, these homes that are like near industrial facilities can also be predisposed to um, lead in the air, lead in the soil. Um, some of these homes are older infrastructure, so they have lead in the paint, so they're dealing with multiple sources of exposure rather than just like lead in the water. So it's like multiple, um, multiple forms that they're like just thinking about. Um, and I think how we're dealing through this right now um, we always like put the community first and we do what like the community needs. Right now we are conducting a survey with one of our partners, uh, the Center for Neighborhood Technology, where we're gauging kind of just like where the community is at and what are some of like the water issues that they're facing, just so we know what it is that we need to respond to, like their immediate needs and what are like some things that require some policy advocacy on our end to make it happen. Um, but that's kind of it for right now. Uh, that's a lot. Um, and thank you for your work. I, um, I think that's really helpful, right, for us to keep front and center is that people don't experience these issues in a vacuum, right? And also these the cumulative impact of several um, threats can, can demand different responses and more comprehensive responses. And with that, I'm actually going to ask Anne um, to share a little bit about your work around water access. I know Elevate has been an incredible partner to the city of Chicago, as well as a number of the, the nonprofits that we work with in, um, er, in the early days of the pandemic, certainly getting the water distribution um, moving um, and you know, serving as a trusted um, partner at, for water distribution and, and pickup, um, but also the data analysis that you all were able to, to help with to help the city of Chicago identify where those homes might be that didn't have water service and that had been disconnected prior to the water shutoff moratorium that we that we still have in place. So Anne, can you can you share a little bit about that? Yes, thank you. So I think, Annalisa, there are really um, at least two big issues that I want to talk about. 
starting with um, um, just plain old having water service. Um, so people, again, great work. Thank you um, to El Vejo and the many advocates, including the um, smiling faces on the screen right now for advocating for a uh, water utility shut off moratorium. That's great. But what we what um, we didn't think of, of at that time and since thought of was, well, what happened to the folks that were already disconnected? What kind of situation were they in? Um, and to share a little bit of the stories that we heard, um, many um, many people were had had their water disconnected, either because there was a leak somewhere on the service line, or for lack of payment. Those are the two main reasons that water service is disconnected, and um, either way, they were likely still getting billed. Um, and and in, and looking at a, a bill with a substantial amount of debt, and in that situation, um, you know, building off of what Brenda already shared about the multiple or cumulative effects of the stress, um, you know, raising your hand and calling um, calling three one one and saying, "Please, can you re reconnect me?" Staring at that like very significant debt, thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, is is a challenge. On, on the city side, the city is in a unique situation where two thirds of the residential accounts are on, are non metered. So that means the city doesn't have a good way of knowing if the water is flowing or not. I know that seems incredible to say, but that is in fact the situation where, where we found ourselves in. And so we were um, able to support the city and do some data analysis to, to find um, our best guess of where we thought people um, were uh, in a situation of living without running water. And in um, we uh, sent out postcards, but more importantly, we worked with community partners like you all um, and many others to get the word out that there was now a resource to get reconnected. Um, and we began working closely with the city to um, home by home, do the, do the necessary plumbing work um, that needed to be done. Sometimes it was on the city side, sometimes it was on the private side. Um, and we would um, work with local plumbers, many of whom are Black and Latinx and from the same communities that are most suffering uh, with this water disconnection problem and getting folks re um, reconnected to water service as well as enrolled in this the city's utility bill assistance program, which helps deal with the debt side. So we want to get folks clean clean um, and affordable water and we and part of that is getting rid of getting rid of the debt so having programs like the utility bill relief program which cuts your bill in half and then over a, a 12 month period um, re reduces or removes all that debt has been an invaluable tool to getting people reconnected and and in a more um, safe way at the same time, so that's the like water water reconnection issue. The other issue I wanted to bring up was that during COVID, all those sources of public water, like the water fountains, like the park districts, like the lakefront, <laughs> um, were all closed. And so, for helping again in in coordination with the city and so many. Um, you know, over 80 community partners, we were able to help support a bottled water distribution system um, that that could get water to people. And that included creating um, with our community, um, actually our community partners created um, pickup sites for folks who had that ability. And then we also would deliver water directly to people's homes is, um, um, because you know, not everyone has access access to um, a vehicle. Uh, probably, you know, 
I, I know my, my even today I'm still a little anxious when I get on the CTA. Um, so so we wanted to make sure we were providing that complete access. Absolutely, and I I will just say I I've slowly started taking the CTA again, and the idea of the it, the idea of like hauling cases of water by bus um, is like would not be manageable, right? So thank you so much for your work. Um, Ayana, I wanna sort of just turn to you and, and we'll pick up on some of these pieces again um, later in the conversation. Um, but I, I just wanna sort of acknowledge the way that in, in which um, IEC Illinois Environmental Council has been um, a leader in, in throughout COVID, and I've seen the organization, which has you know served as a resource for so many environmental partners across the state, um, really step up during the pandemic. I, I've seen sort of a, a growth in sort of the way in which IEC has been an ally on important environmental justice issues, working closely with um, Chicago Environmental Justice Network, um, and also doing defense and strong advocacy around the state budget and, and those negotiations as relief dollars have flowed in. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how, how your water work shows up within um, sort of certainly the budget negotiations um, that, that your team, your colleagues have been have been leading on, um, but also how IEC's water advocacy portfolio has sort of evolved during the pandemic. Yeah, so I mean, I definitely think that the pandemic has definitely, you know, pivoted what IEC focused on with water affordability. Um, even prior to the pandemic, of course, we were concerned about people having access to water and recognizing that even before then, people didn't have access. So there were people who, you know, were dehydrated. There were people who weren't able to cook for themselves. There were people that had their homes condemned. Like all these different public health and socioeconomic impacts coming from not having access to water. But I think really the pandemic kind of switched it to where we were recognizing that, oh, people also, that also means that people can't cook home food while they're being forced to quarantine, or people cannot wash down their countertops if they don't have water, or people can't um, take a shower or wash their hands. Like these are all things that are really, really incredible or really impossible or nearly impossible to do when you don't have access to water. But I think on a larger scale, the pandemic shed light on one that you know, it drew more attention to the fact that people don't have, like some people don't have access to water, but I think an even bigger issue really is that we don't know how many people don't have access to water. And during the pandemic, that's where I see some of our advocacy shifted to, looking to, you know, how are utilities being uh, overseen? So in Illinois, um, there's the Illinois Commerce Commission, which oversees investor-owned utilities, so that, or at least investor-owned water utilities. So that's things like American Water, Aqua Illinois, um, and those are private, privately owned utilities. They have to have some type of reporting requirement that they report to the commission. Separately, there are municipal, municipal ran water utilities. So for example, the Department of Water Management would be a municipal ran water utility. They have virtually little oversight over, the stuff, over anything that they're doing. And so during the pandemic, while we knew already that people were having their water shut off, we didn't know how many people were having their water shut off. We didn't know how many people were being reconnected. And these municipal ran utilities represent a majority of the folks across the state. So we had a conversation with the governor's office. We also had a conversation with IEPA and, you know, it, it came down to like, nobody really knows. There's not a clear oversight over who's monitoring what. Um, and I think that plays, you know, a larger role that where we need greater oversight even now because, um, you know, the statewide moratorium, it did not apply to municipal and water utilities. With or without that moratorium, we still don't know how many utilities are still enforcing it. We are still in a pandemic. So I think there's still this larger conversation about oversight over all water utilities. I think there's this larger conversation about a lack of overall data that we don't know how big the issue is. And I think on a larger scale, you know, we talk about um, like the national low income water, the national um, LIWAP and water assistance program, making the case for the amount of funding that Illinois needs becomes even harder when we don't have this data on how many people that don't have access to water. So I know we'll talk about that a little bit more, but for IEC, our, our main focus has really just been switching over to the oversight um, of water utilities. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know, you know, you're hitting on a lot of the, the themes that I know continue to come up in the meetings that we're all constantly in, it feels like, um, around these broader, broader questions of water governance and transparency. Um, 
I think we certainly can can get into some of some of that um, at sort of a at sort of a, a deeper level when we think about affordability and infrastructure. Um, but the fragmented nature of the water sector makes it really hard um, to really get a full picture of what the water burden looks like um, for for residents. What is the actual like? What is a what is our best guess at how much? funding we need to provide um, remedies and, and what, what are the policy solutions that are required that becomes infinitely harder, right, if you don't have a good analysis of the problem um, because it's all spread out across, you know, a thousand plus different utilities. Um, and that's actually where I want to start. Um, it's kind of impossible to separate the conversation around water affordability um, and the, the conversation around infrastructure investment, but I'm going to try to start um, with affordability and and I'm going to ask you to, to start us off. Your team investigated water burden across the Chicago land region, along with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant and Metropolitan Planning Council. It's a great report that came out in early 2020 um, that we can, um, you know, maybe plug uh, in follow up emails from this conversation. Um, but I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your findings around water burden and affordability. And if you have updated data or if you just have sort of an understanding of how this has shifted maybe even more since the pandemic. Yeah, I do. And thank you. I put um, I put a link to the to the report in the chat, but I'll talk a little bit about it and, and it's and our findings. Um, so what we know is that water service costs are on the rise here where we are today and, and nationally. And at the same time, incomes are not. So we looked at water burden, which is defined in a very specific way of um, total um, total water water and sewer costs over a household's income. And then we looked at it for different income groups. Um, and we think that's an important approach to take because. Um, Part of the policy um, challenge is that water burdens or what's considered affordable is considered affordable for the average income in a community. So if we're talking about a community like Chicago, which has huge disparities in income, so we have some really wealthy folk and we have a big population that is um, living paycheck to paycheck and, and, and every, you know, living in a situation where expenses are outpacing in income. And so we think it's really important to look at different income groups. Um, if you take a look at the report, you will see that we built a um, water affordability dashboard tool. I'll put that in the link as well. Um, and I, um, in case you can't find it, it's in the report, but just to make it easier, we'll put the dashboard in there as well. What we found um, is that, you know, water, water and sewer rates are increasing. Additional charges um, are getting tacked onto water and sewer bills. So maybe garbage, maybe taxes. Um, there are additional penalties associated with late payments. So, um, so people are dealing with not only struggling to pay the current bill, but also dealing with that debt that builds up over time. Um, an additional challenge is that um, uh, in order to um, try to recover that debt, so there may be a threat of putting a lien on somebody's home. So um, imagine the stress of being, of, of being afraid of losing your home because of a lien. Um, is, it's, it's, it's too much to manage. Um, and of course, um, during the COVID, um, well, we're still in COVID, there are the impacts of COVID, right, of lost income uh, during the water mor moratorium, uh, folks rightly had to um, prioritize other expenses like food. Um, and so debt is growing during that period of time. Um, the the resources that are coming from the federal government and from the state government that Yana referenced um, take some time to get out the door. Um, there's always um, 
there's often a local uh, state, county or state capacity challenge in the, at the government level to get all the doors out, dollars out the door quickly. So a lot of people remain um, struggling with just a great deal of debt and the COVID relief has not shown up yet. Um, we did find that, um, of course, the, the folks with lower incomes have really, can have really high water burdens, meaning 15% of their income is going to pay for water when you imagine all the other things you have to pay for. Um, that is you know, widely considered multiple times way too high. Um, again, you can look at the dashboard to see how your community is doing. Um, and while, when you look at the report, you'll see a map, um, we love to make maps, and you'll see the, um, that there really is water burden across the Northeastern Illinois region. But when we look at it by race, we do see Black, Latin, Latinx, BIPOC communities um, struggling with greater water burden than, than other communities. So it is, there is definitely inequity there. Um, we um, found that uh, water burden for single family, two flats, um, three flats is, is the highest. Um, so that is, the, that is the community that needs the most um, help. And we had um, this, uh, we had, this is more anecdotal, but we've had the cities and villages across Cook County reporting to us that as much as 50% of their um, um, accounts have are in debt. So there is also you know, a problem for the water utility that the debt is so great they won't be able to um, collect it. And so as we think collectively about the best, um, the best use of the federal and state subsidy, we know that it needs to go to communities of color first and not last. In, in order to um, um, set, set us up back towards a path of resiliency and hopefully towards equity. Um, we also learned that um, there's, a, there's a gap in knowledge and understanding of how water, water bills work. It's, it's very um, opaque. <laughs> it's not clear what you're getting charged for and what you can do to reduce your charges. We found that um, older populations needed more assistance um, and that um, also with COVID and the, um, the loss of the very important social safety net that exists, not only um, through faith-based communities and community-based or organizations and families um, that folks are really, really struggling and are in this circular um, situation of financial hardship where they're, they have the in inability to improve their properties and therefore reduce their bills. Um, and they're facing constant ba basic needs trade-offs. And as just to take us back to where Brenda started us with, if you can't pay a water bill, likely you can't pay your gas bill or your electric bill either. So we were helping people really across this, the spectrum. Thank you, Anne. Um, and I really can't stress enough how great that report, or how illuminating, I should say, that report was. Um, it's in the chat for folks who, who um, can go ahead and, and click through, save it for later. It's an important read. Um, I, I am reminded to Brenda of a conversation that we recently had. I think you're in this sort of interesting position where you know, your team is on the ground like to the level of going door to door and also in meetings with the mayor's office and IEPA and the governor's office um, addressing some of these affordability issues, both in that sort of um, emergency response sort of mode. Um, and I think Ayana will, will talk a little bit about that piece um, later. But I, I want to know um, from, from your perspective, um, you know, how this is tracking on the ground. Um, what you're understanding from you know your conversations in community and how the needs that you're surfacing and your team is surfacing are reflected in the policy advocacy work that you're doing. 
Yeah, definitely. Like you said, you know, engaging with like the community members is like one of like the most essential parts of the work that we do. You know, it really drives like the research and the policy work that we're doing as a, as an organization. Um, one thing that has come up since like the start, of, like the outreach that we've been doing for the lead service line um, pilot um, is that a lot of homes are very hesitant about getting meters installed or like the thought of like, you know, getting just um, installing a meter in their home. Um, there's a lack of understanding of how households are built. Like Anne said, um, sometimes we've spoken to community members who don't really understand the way that their water bills are charged um, and like what certain charges like mean on their bills. Um, so like we recognize that these households can benefit from improved like communication strategies and other basic educational, educational materials uh, from the city to better understand the billing system and um, even learning about like what the benefits of like meter metering is. Um, we know that metering is essential in creating like affordable water rate structures. Um, you know, without a meter, homes aren't built um, to the amount of water that they're using. It's just based on the average property size. Um, and it's not really representative of like the water usage in the home. Um, so definitely like encouraging folks um, to, to learn about the benefits of like meters and just like educational materials is gonna be really essential in like moving that work around affordability forward. And then also another thing that has come up in the community is the need for like broader outreach on like some of the cities like existing like resources and programs that they have. Uh, we know that like the utility billing relief program exists. There's other um, forms of exemptions that like residents can also apply for but they don't necessarily know that the resources are there. Um, so definitely just advocating for like improved um, assistance programs, like improving the enrollment process um, and the outreach uh, for some of these programs to make sure that like, you know, these households are taking advantage of like the programs that are meant to serve them. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I am reminded of like how in the, especially in the early um, era of the utility billing relief program and responding, which was just last year, but um, uh, everyone's timeline is, is, is sort of skewed now, I feel like, um, at least mine is. Um, I would just remember how easy it was for, for folks, for administrators to forget that those resources also have to be multilingual, um, that they are most, um, they're most often going to be read and received when delivered by a trusted messenger. Um, so thank you for, for your work, because I know that's a role that your team plays. Um, I, I want to um, ask Ayana to talk a little bit about some of the programs that I think have kind of come up um, that Anne and Brenda have referenced. Um, you know, you and I have worked on a few different pieces, um, including tracking the Illinois implementation plan for, for that Low Income Household Water Assistance Program, LIWA, but it's a mouthful. It's designed to be an emergency response um, program, but like Anne said, it took takes months to get out the door. Um, and so I'm gonna ask you to share a little bit about that. And then also um, we've referenced on this call um, and Anne has shared a little bit about um, the utility building relief program that we have here in Chicago. Um, and then additionally, the bill that passed, the lead service line replacement bill, that passed this year um, at the state level includes sort of a framework for a statewide assistance program. So I'm wondering, you know, that's a lot to track. If you can just kind of walk us through the highlights of sort of these different um, approaches at the different levels of government that we, you know, that folks hopefully soon will have access to setting aside that question of like tracking all of it and the administrative burden piece. Yeah, so I'll talk first about the National Library Program and then what's in the state bill and then I'll touch on UBR at the city level. So the National LIWAP, I'm just going to call it that. <laughs> the National Library Program, as Annalisa said, it's an emergency two-year program um, that's really aimed at low-income residents um, that have a high water burden. So it really just goes towards helping with reconnection and uh, air ages, so past water bills like late fees. Um, and so Illinois received 42 million. Uh, so the benefits are capped. Um, and the part of that reason why is 42 million one is just not a, a lot of money. Um, and then second, you know, in Chicago alone, there's 10,000 people that have $5,000 or more in water debt. So if, the, if there was no cap, I mean, that would be 
right there, all that money would go straight to Chicago. So they have capped it to $1,500 per person. Um, and it's supposed to affect about 28,000 Illinoisans. And again, that goes towards right, reconnection costs, late fees, areages, et cetera. Um, so in short, what it does do is, you know, during the time we don't have a statewide moratorium and we don't have really any serious oversights over utilities, it does provide reconnections for those people. It also provides uh, water assistance to renters. The program is uh, open to them as long as they can prove that part of their rent is water is water charges. What it doesn't do where it, there's a shortfall is that it isn't a permanent program. So um, it's not gonna make permanent, uh, it's not gonna make reconnections permanent. It's not going to stop water shutoffs permanently. Um, and it doesn't in service the entire need that Illinois has. 28,000 people is a decent amount, but we may have twice as many of those people that actually need that help. So, um, and it also doesn't, finally, it doesn't address that data issue that I mentioned earlier. So there's no one agency that oversees all water utilities in the state. So with that and the fact that, you know, the Office of Community Services, that's the national office, as well as DCEO, which is the Illinois office that's implementing this, that the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, I'm always asked what that stands for, but they're the ones implementing the program and they also don't have the authority to mandate that um, under this IWAP program utilities have to, you know, disclose like how many people are disconnected or reconnected. So they're like, there's some benefits to the program, but I think overall it truly is an emergency program and it doesn't get at some of those long term needs that we that we have for water affordability. Um, at the state level in the lead service line replacement bill, we have uh, the low income water assistance program and that, that's a little bit more bare bones It's kind of language that we put there just to have like a framework for it. And part of that bill has like an advisory board that will go back in and really uh, flush some of that stuff out, but that would truly be a water assistance program that would provide like a percentage rate discount um, based on someone's income um, and lowering their water their water bill. Um, and then finally, at the city level at Chicago, um, there's the Utility Building Relief Program. So this originally started off back in January as a pilot program, but we now know that it's going to continue through next year. And I think either Brenda or Ann had already kind of given the gist of the program. So it's a 50% reduction in water and sewer charges. And then if you're able to make with that discounted rate, if you're able to make it on time for an entire year, that means that your everything, like all of your debt that you get, all your water debt that you have is immediately wiped out. Um, and if you do, if you have some months where you don't pay on time, you are allowed to re-enroll in the program. So in short, what it does, it provides a huge debt forgiveness um, and it is a decent amount of assistance. Um, but what it doesn't do, again, the issue of data, um, and it doesn't provide Oh, sorry, I didn't see that it had left. Um, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't provide that data need. It doesn't provide assistance to renters, and it also doesn't provide assistance to um, unit play homes that are three plus or more units. It really just applies to single family homes and two flats. Um, and participants are still subject to rate increases. Um, I know IEC, Alvejo, uh, Lions for Great Lakes, we're all working on what could be possibly like an amendment to the utility building relief program that could address the renter issue, the data issues, and among a few other things. Um, but I think the shortfall really with this program and Overall, just with these assistance programs is that assistance does not equal water affordability. And I think we've put a lot of our, our and this isn't just us as organizations, but just in general, I guess as a society, we've put a lot of time and like, you know, thought into assistance programs, which are great and are needed immediately, but we still have a long-term issue with affordable water rates. And so I think kind of tying that all together, we have these programs that have some issues that need to be fixed, but overall, we want to see an affordable water rate system. We want to see people who are using the least amount of water are paying the least amount and people are using it the most. So businesses and industry are paying the most. Um, and that's that's kind of where I see we're, we're trying to move towards a little bit, um, still focus on assistance, but trying to move just towards like rate restructure. Absolutely, that's a, that's a really important distinction, right? Um, and I'm glad that you made it. Um, these assistance programs, while they can prove critical, especially the ones like you know, we have here in Chicago that have a debt relief um, component um, can be life changing for people who are carrying significant debt um, and whose water rates go up and whose in income has not. 
Um, but it's not the same thing as um, oh, whether it's rate reform or sort of deeper affordability uh, mechanisms. And to do that, like we do need uh, greater investment, um, but it needs to be equitable investment. And we also need, as Ayana, I appreciate you coming back to this point around um, clearer water governance um, and data transparency um, across what is a very fragmented sector. Um, and we could probably have our whole own webinar about each of these topics, but we're only, we only got about 10 minutes left and, and Anne did have to step away. Um, but I, I don't want to, I don't want to sell us short on um, this issue of, of lead service line replacement. Um, I think a lot of the folks who are uh, listening in probably know this, but lead is toxic to human health. It is especially damaging. Um, to young children, um, to brain development, um, and also was required. Uh, it was required until the late 80s um, that builders use lead as the material for the service line that connects homes um, from the water main to the home. Um, so essentially we have, uh, that leaves us with um, about 400,000 homes uh, where people are, are you know, essentially drinking through a lead straw. Um, there are corrosion controls in place. Like I don't mean to incite panic, but it is a serious issue. Um, and it's an issue that the city of Chicago um, recently um, has sort of has taken up after a long time of sort of um, silence or, or sort of ignoring the issue of lead service lines. Um, the Lightfoot administration has acknowledged this le legacy problem and developed um, a pilot replacement program that I know all of us and Anne and many of our amazing colleagues have been part of um, addressing, understanding, providing feedback to the city. Um, and I'm wondering, Ayana or Brenda, um, if, if either of you feels like ready to sort of quickly recap um, what the city is doing now, um, but then also sharing, you know, what you think we need um, moving forward. And I'll note um, the, and maybe we can start Ayana with, with with you, um, while the city of Chicago will be subject to to the guidelines in the new, uh, and the, sorry, the requirements in the new lead service line replacement bill, um, it does get a fifty year uh, carve out. Um, and so maybe you can maybe you can start there with what's happening at the state level, and then quickly what's happening in Chicago. Again, sorry, we're we're running out of time here, but want to make sure that we're giving people a picture of that. Yeah, no, I'll be quick. Um, so yeah, with the lead bill, again, you know, shout out to Vejo, Alliance for Great Lakes, others that have helped us on that, as well as the sponsors. Um, so Representative Lamont Robinson and Senator Melinda Bush. Um, in short, what the bill does is that it requires municipalities and water suppliers to find and replace all lead service lines in Illinois, um, prioritizing lead burning communities and childcare facilities. As Annalisa mentioned, uh, the communities are given like have individualized timetables. So Chicago, which has 390,000 lead service lines, has the most lead service lines, they're gonna get 50 years, but obviously a place such as Kankakee is not gonna also get 50 years. Um, another, uh, there's a few other elements to part of the lead bill. So it creates like a fund that can go towards not only lead service line replacement, but for municipalities that finish replacing their lead service lines or don't have any, it would be a fund that they could then use for other water infrastructure upgrades. It also um, establishes an advisory board, and then it also includes the statewide water assistance program. The biggest connection is just at the city level, it now puts, it basically now sets the city on an actual timetable before. I know um, Chicago currently has its equity and homeowner led service on replacement programs, um, which were not necessarily didn't have a real timeline. And this state bill is now saying that, hey, this is the timeline that you need to get all this work done by. And um, pivoting over to like the city level, uh, yeah, again, the city has the equity um, lead service on replacement program. So that's for low income residents. It can provide free lead service on replacement. And then there's the homeowner lead service on replacement program, which provides um, anyone who doesn't meet that criteria for the equity program can apply and get waiver fees um, waived. But of the part, the cost of the actual lead service on replacement would need to continue uh, or would be at a regular rate. So that's kind of the breakdown of what's happening and kind of the connection between the state and the city. It really just puts a little bit more pressure on the city to get the lead service on replacement done 
at a quicker timeline when we're currently at 10 load service lines replaced. Yeah, um, progress has been slow. I, I do know, so the city, just to add a little bit of context, and I'm gonna ask Brenda to weigh in. Um, the city is operating um, the, the pilot replacement program on a community development block grant that is extended into next year. Um, and so, it, yes, there's like the equity um, program that offers, you know, for, for um, a somewhat limited um, eligibility, sort of eligible population, a free replacement, but then homeowner initiated where the city waives um, about $3,000 in fees, but, but the full cost of lead service line replacement re remains with the homeowner. And then the third piece, and this is where I wanna to get to you, Brenda, um, included in that pilot project um, that we're hoping to draw lots of lessons from and like use to accelerate, use the, the, that learning and hopefully additional investment um, to accelerate the rate of lead service line replacement. Um, one of the, the sort of third component there is um, the block level replacement. So the city of Chicago has selected um, a block in Little Village where they are with a mix of different um, housing stock where they're replacing a water main and all the lead service lines attached um, to it. And so that's the idea there is that we can start to identify some efficiencies and understand how this would look at scale. Um, but Brenda, as, as somebody you know, who's in the community and where your team is knocking on doors, um, I'm really curious to know on the ground if you have any observations to share. Um, and also knowing that you know, your advocacy and your team's advocacy has been helpful in marshalling resources to get lead service line replacement moving. Um, so I'm wondering if in the last few minutes, you can kind of share what you're seeing on the ground and then also you know, what you think it's gonna take um, to, to move us forward on a timeline that's going to really serve the people who need it. Yeah, so I would say that like one big takeaway from this process is I, I feel like I mentioned it before, but community education is so essential in like just moving the process forward. Um, I think towards the beginning of like the pilot program, there was still a lack of like just basic understanding of what lead was and how lead impacts um, the water in people's homes. I think people still struggle to understand how they would benefit in the long run, like opting in in this program. Um, so it wasn't just a matter of like having the resources to get the pipes out of the ground, but also like, how do you build the trust between the city, the Department of Water Management and like these households that they are serving? Um, you know, our community organizer was like able to have like informal talks with like some of the residents on the block. She was able to answer some of the questions that these like um, community members didn't really have the confidence um, or like um, they weren't comfortable like asking the city, like we were able to like kind of fill in some gaps there. So I think um, using the relationships that like, you know, these community-based organizations have like in these neighborhoods where we are replacing the lead service lines is like really essential. Um, just in like fortifying that trust and like that understanding um, and helping like enroll like some folks into the program. Um, you know, we know that like water infrastructure and like affordability is um, a statewide issue um, and it needs to be addressed everywhere, like not just here in Chicago. Um, and like, you know, the recently passed state law to mandate the replacement of lead service lines um, really allows us the opportunity to like mobilize resources and, you know, collaborate with other cities um, throughout the state to expedite this process, you know, um, I'm glad that like we're able to like mandate the replacement now, but 50 years is still a really long time. So if we're able to mobilize these resources to like get it done anytime faster, like that would um, obviously be amazing. Um, we definitely have the opportunity to secure like safe drinking water for future generations. And we need to continue to advocate like the importance of this issue um, to secure federal funding and like get it done. Absolutely. And I, um... You know, for, for folks who are following, um, you may be wondering why we didn't we didn't go deep on um, federal resources. I think um, that landscape is shifting, um, and we know that whether you know whether we get the influx of funding from the federal government, um, or you know whether it doesn't turn out to be sort of the the moment that I think advocates everywhere are hoping that it is. Um, that we are going to need continued advocacy, both in terms of securing and mobilizing resources and people and people power, um, but also holding holding um, you know our water systems to account um, and and being a partner to uh, the water administrators, the cities, um, the state, 
agencies that are taking this on. Um, we've got a lot of really amazing colleagues that are not, I think, with us in the audience or or on this panel who deserve a lot of credit um, for some of the some of the programs that we've named um, and securing the the water shut off moratorium in Chicago and rolling out assistance programs. Um, but we've got a very broad and ambitious agenda um, for what comes next. And I want to thank you all um, for being with us to, to talk to some of the leading advocates who are driving that work forward. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but um, I'm going to drop my email in the chat and we are going to um, follow up with folks via email with a recording, um, some of the resources that we listed. And it's been such a pleasure to, to speak with you all today. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you all.